So for today's review, I'm going to be taking a look at Days Gone, which is a exclusive PS4 title from Sony's very own Ben Studio, which you may remember for the Siphon Filter games on the PlayStation. Now, Days Gone is a third person open world action adventure game where you play as a biker called Deacon St. John as he tries to survive with his motorcycle club brother Boozer during a zombie like apocalypse which has just broken out all the while trying to find out just what exactly has happened to his wife Sarah after they were both separated two years ago when the zombie outbreak first occurred. Now Days Gone plays like a mixture of your favourite PlayStation games. There is firstly the obvious connection to Last of Us due to the game's story, setting and sort of tone as well as its gunplay and controls. Then you also have similarities to Horizon Zero Dawn as you have this large open world to explore where you can meet other camps and settlements and get missions off them and there is also a sort of scavenging um, wildlife sort of survival aspect which Horizon also had. Then the third game I would compare this to would be Mad Max which came out a few years ago mainly because of how Deacon St. John is with his bike and that you have to look after it, make sure you repair it and also keep it topped up with fuel which was very much like it was in the Mad Max game with the car. So now you know what Days Gone sort of is all about. So now I'm going to explain what I liked and what I disliked about Days Gone. So let's go. The story is perhaps one of the greatest things about Days Gone as it's just really gripping. I found myself totally hooked on it. It's a story that is effectively, well, it's a love story set within a zombie apocalypse. It deals with love, loss, friendship, as well as moral issues and survival and what is right and wrong in these harsh times as it blends the lines on multiple occasions and it shows both sides really and how neither is you know, truly the right way. The story itself is an epic tale and it does start off fairly slow and simple with an easy to understand premise. However, as you explore the world deeper, you uncover more camps and more people, which brings with it more layers to a story and more depth to Deacon's character as he struggles to balance his responsibility to find his wife and the responsibility he feels for the camps who look to and depend on him. Then you have the Boozer parts, uh, where Boozer gets hurt and it's sort of Deacon's fault, so he feels responsible for his biker brother, and he has to sort of look after him and make sure he's alright. And things happen with Boozer and he sort of goes down a bit of a dark path. Um, then you get the stuff with Nero, the sort of government agency that have come in, in hazmat suits sprinkled in which also had new layers as you go on the story builds and builds and in the last quarter of the game it does something that quite frankly I wasn't expecting and you end up going in a different direction to what you initially may have thought the story would be it's such a great game and the story was really interesting um, and yeah it was just it was great to watch and great to take part in. Um, brilliant. The initial load when booting up the game takes absolutely fucking ages. And I didn't really know why it was taking so long. Because it just loads the title screen. Nothing else. And then after a while I realised the reason it takes ages is because it's loading your customised bike onto the main menu screen to show it off. Now... This is a nice feature, I guess, but at the cost of a long load, I'd barely say it was worth the wait. Plus, I didn't even actually clock it was my actual bike from the game until about 50% of the way through the story. The game also has lots of loads between cutscenes and gameplay, even when the cutscene is a tiny one. For example, you might get off your bike, walk a bit, 
then it loads, you see a cutscene, then it loads again, you're back on foot controlling it, and it just really breaks the flow of a scene, and it's one of the sort of weaker aspects of the game, in just how choppy it is. The gunplay in Days Gone reminds me heavily of Last of Us, in how you crouch walk instead of snapping automatically to cover. And the shooting mechanics are the same sort of thing, it's still very solid. It's so satisfying shooting any gun you have, and you really feel the impact of your bullets or arrows. There are a range of guns at your disposal that you can buy, and best of all, you can also pick up guns from downed enemies, as well as the ammo. I played through a good 50% of the game using the standard pistol, rifle and the crossbow, later switching out the rifle for a machine gun to deal with the massive hordes. But there were so many other weapons available, there is always something for someone. You also have a focus meter which allows you to go into slow motion for a few seconds as well as improving your aim to make headshots even easier. It also lets you get some great kills in slow motion, which is always fun. The weapon wheel. God damn this thing is clunky to use. It's fine if you want to just select a standard weapon, but whenever you try and go into the sum menus for each item, such as the health section where once you go into it you can see all the different bandages, medipacks or stamina pills that you can take, or, for example, when you select the crossbow, you then get a sub-menu where you can see all the different arrow types available to then equip them on the crossbow. More often than not, when selecting something and then selecting something within that one's sub-menu, I would pick something and then go to use it, only to find that it snapped back to a different item or the default one in that menu when I've let go of the stick and closed the menu down. Now, this may be just me, but I did find it rather finicky enough times that it became really fucking frustrating, especially in moments when you're under pressure, such as during a horde battle, where you don't really have that much time to get it out and sort your thing out, because you're being chased by a load of freakers, and then when you do pull it out and you find out you haven't got that right weapon type or ammo type, it can almost result in you dying. The bike, by extension, is a part of Deacon, and is a character in its own right to be fair, one in which you can visually customise and upgrade to improve its stats. The handling is great, it's not too sim-like, yet it's not too floaty and arcadey, it sort of has a nice middle ground, allowing you to easily and quickly get to grips with it and start drifting around at high speeds or weaving in and out of trees in no time. You also have to look after your bike, repairing it with scrap found in the environment when it takes damage. So it makes any careless driving have consequence, creating a great sense of tension if you happen to wreck your bike in an area with freakers nearby. You may have to hunt for scrap and risk fighting freakers along the way, wasting ammo or try to repair it quickly and silently so you can speed out of there. The bike also has a fuel meter so you can run out of petrol and while this sounds annoying, it actually isn't, as it works to add tension and risk versus reward. Do you explore to find petrol and risk running into freakers, or do you brave it on foot back to a camp and then pay them to tow your bike back? It's a brilliant system, and it's very similar to Mad Max in those respects. It gives every journey out in the open world a sense of danger, as you can quite quickly find yourself in trouble if you run out of fuel or break your bike. However, it's not overly punishing as to get in the way of enjoying the game, as you can upgrade the bike to make it stronger and have it have a bigger tank to hold even more petrol. Wolves. When driving your bike through the open world, you can occasionally be chased down by a pack of wolves. These will charge at you while you're on your bike, and you get a brief slow-mo bit whenever they jump to pounce on you to shoot them down. You can attack them with your pistol, but they do take a few shots. And worse still, later on in the game, you'll find you get chased by them more often. And, at that point, there's infected wolves, and then these are bigger, faster and stronger, and they take more bullets. And they always used to just appear when I just didn't need the hassle. 
And by the end of the game, they just fucking annoy me every time they showed up. Piss off, Wolf. Hands down, Days Gone boasts one of the most impressive casts I've seen in a long time in a video game. The voice actors behind these characters all do a wonderful job. Special mention for me must go to Sam Witwer as Deacon, Jim Pirry, I believe, as Boozer, Nishi Munchi, apologies for the pronunciation of that, as Ricky, and of course Courtney Draper, who you may remember as the voice of Elizabeth in Bioshock Infinite. She plays Sarah, and she naturally does a great job here as her, and the actress is a big reason why you invest in her and Deacon's relationship and want them to get that happy ending. Sam himself, as Deacon, is a great likeable character and actor, and he does a great job in this game. He was Starkiller in those Force Awakens uh, Star Wars games, and just like that game, he also lends his actual likeness as well as his voice to the character of Deacon, so you really get to see his facial expressions, and it really helps to sell this character as he actually does look like a real person. I think the other actors may have also lent their likenesses, however their appearances seem to have been altered more than Deacon's. Of the main actors, I think everyone is perfectly cast, and they all help to raise the bar and make this a quality product. I don't think there's any really bad voice acting in the main cast. There's a couple of ropey ones as like, you know, side characters or people you see in the open world, but they only got a couple of lines so it doesn't really affect it. But the main cast itself, ah, oh, it's solid. It's really good. He can't swim. He can't fucking swim. Fuck me. In fact, no, he can swim, but only for like five seconds or so, as you have this stupid countdown to death, fucking bar ticking down as soon as you enter any deep water. It's so fucking stupid, as if you crash your bike into water, you swim so fucking slow that you'll never have enough time to swim back to shore, so you just end up dying a fool's death. It's 2019 now, we've come a long way since GTA 3 and the original Assassin's Creed games. I thought we were past characters that can't swim in open world games. Ugh, sadly not. Like The Last of Us, the melee combat in this game is absolutely brutal, and hitting freakers or human enemies with your knife or a melee weapon is just so satisfying, as you really feel every, every swing, every punch, every slash, especially when you have a bat, or maybe a bat with spikes on, or a bat with a sword blade on, or a bait, bat with bolts on, or a pipe, you know, well... You get the idea. You really uh, you feel it when it hits, man. It's such a great feeling. Fuck yeah. Touch controls in the menu. For fuck's sake, why do I have to swipe on the initial screens to access all the submenus? It actually disables a D-pad here. What the fuck were they thinking? It's such a pain in the ass. Jesus Christ, man. The Freakers are another highlight of the game, as they're a really cool enemy to fight against, and at times they're quite terrifying. I also like that animals are also infected, so you don't just fight against human ones, you fight against birds, bears, and infected wolves as well. The humans, though, they range from adult ones who run at you, to children called newts that hang back, usually on rooftops, ready to pounce on you when your back is turned. Later on, newer types are introduced, like a female screamer that will call in others nearby. There's also like a large brute one that will grab you and throw you around. And there's also a super fast one that's quite annoying as he's too damn fast to actually hit. The normal freaker zombie types aren't that strong, however what they make up for is numbers. There's a lot of them and they can easily overwhelm you. They will try and circle you and get you in the middle of a crowd, and then they just all wail on you, and it's not long before you die. It's best when fighting these to just keep moving, as you can sort of run faster than them, though only for a limited time as your stamina will run out, especially if you're rolling all over the place. Though every battle with these, I must say, was always fun. Whether I was shooting them, whether I was laying traps for them with bombs, 
or throwing cocktails at them, or even just using a bat or knife to melee them to death. Every encounter was great, and it was so intense at times. Yeah. Throughout my playthrough of Days Gone, I unfortunately encountered a lot of glitches, mostly minor, but it does make it feel like this is a less polished AAA exclusive than most of Sony's games. A couple of them were funny, but there were a few that blocked mission progress, forcing me to restart. The game also suffers quite badly from slowdown, and you'll find that your controls just go all weird and laggy as well at times, especially in the later half of the game when you go into a new area. It just doesn't seem to be able to cope with what's going on on screen. Even when you're fighting hordes at times, the controls can just go all weird. Like you're just pointing in one direction and your inputs aren't recognised for a few seconds. It's kind of frustrating to be fair, and it is a bad point of the game. The human enemies as well are also fun to fight against. You have the standard guys and girls with ranged guns, as well as ones who use melee weapons and these tend to just charge at you. You also get this whipper gang, this rest in peace gang, and they're a bit more crazy so they'll set themselves on fire and run at you and do all sorts of weird shit. Later on, the normal soldier enemy types get upgraded with protective armour so you have to shoot a helmet off before you can headshot them. And they also get some bigger specialist weapon type enemies such as a big one with a minigun or a flamethrower. I must say as well, the AI for these is fairly intelligent, though at times they can be a bit dull. Though, on the majority of times, they are pretty smart. There was one time where I was fighting in a little little street, and I had killed most of a large group, and then I realised that the final two had disappeared. I thought it just glitched out. But in actual fact, they had both retreated into a nearby building to hold up together and try and defend it against me. Now, I thought this was fucking amazing, as I just wasn't expecting them to run away. I thought they would stay behind their cover and just wait for me to kill them, but instead, they actually were quite smart and decided to hold up somewhere. I couldn't actually get in the front of the building, I had to go through a window upstairs and then go and attack them. But at that point, I just thought, wow, this game's amazing. They also will ambush you at times, which I think is pretty cool. So maybe in towns, they will set up a tripwire trap at a gas station, or they'll wait for you to pull in and start filling up the tank and then attack you to try and get the drop on you. All in all, though, the human enemies are also just as fun to fight as the Freakers. Enemy snipers in the game are also really fucking annoying, as you'll often find they're absolutely fucking miles away, and if you haven't equipped a sniper in your specialist slot, then you're probably shit out of luck for the most part. It's even worse when they snipe you off a bike, as they will actually destroy your bike as well, forcing you to repair the engine, so you better hope you've got some scrap on you. There are a lot more frustrating towards the end of the game because there's a lot of them within a battle where you're fighting other enemies close up and you've got like two or three snipers from miles away just taking pot shots at you. Liberating an enemy camp and killing everyone in it is really fun, especially if you try and do it stealthily and watch as the remaining people in there start to freak out as their guys are killed one by one. These fights are always entertaining, you tend to get between 8 to 15 enemies to kill in a specific area and the mission will be completed upon killing the last one. The fights are always entertaining and each one offers a new challenge. Plus, one of the cool things is, while doing some of these, the outside open world randomness still affects these missions. So you might find that the noise of a big gunfight might bring in a few freakers, bears or wolves into the mix, which will attack both you and the other enemies in the game, which just makes it all a bit of a free-for-all at times. But these missions are very much a cool thing and I'm glad they're in there. There's not too many so they don't overstay their welcome and they're nicely spaced out on the map. Clearing a camp of enemies is great fun, 
However, what's not fun is afterwards when the game asks you to find the bunker, yet it doesn't feel the need to point it out on the map or a waypoint marker anywhere. Why the fuck can't they just be on the radar? On some of these fucking camps, I spent more time aimlessly running around trying to find the goddamn bunker hatch than I did to actually kill all of the fucking enemies. I mean, come on. It's just so fucking frustrating. There's just no need for it. It should just be there. It should just point to where it is so I can just go down it, collect whatever upgrade I've got and just be on my way. But instead, no, I've got to fucking wander around for ages. Jesus yes. Christ. Oh, there it is. Fuck's sake. Days Gone has a really detailed progress tracker menu, which is really handy for people like me who are going for the platinum trophy run of the game. In these menus, it groups together all of the collectibles, splitting them up into different categories for the different types of collectibles. And thanks to a really useful numbering system, it allows you to easily consult a guide online and find the exact ones you need. The game also has an in-game trophy list, allowing you to keep track of all the trophies and your progress towards each one. Then there is the storyline section which details all the game's missions and your progress throughout each one, as well as all the side missions that you may come across. I think this menu is fantastic to be honest, and I feel like more games should have this. Back on track. Colonel has the bounty missions are some side missions you can get from people in the various camps you visited, and they usually involve you tracking down a rogue member of that camp and killing them. However, some of the missions involved you bringing that person back alive and these would usually result in a really awful bike chase. Chasing people on the bike is rather ropey, and there was one mission where I just couldn't do it, as I'd not upgraded the bike enough to be fast enough to get ahead of the bike. So as a result, after trailing behind the bike but still keeping pace with it, I ran out of pistol bullets, so I could no longer fire at the bike to make him crash, but I wasn't fast enough to catch up to the bike and ram it with my own, even if I took some shortcuts. So I was just at a weird game of cat and mouse for ages until eventually I ran out of fuel and could no longer chase them. This is just total bullshit, and they just weren't as fun or as exciting as they could have been to be honest, especially when other bikers spawn in to help the other guy out so you have to shoot them. They were just frustrating, and I kind of dreaded them whenever they came up. Well, I think I already did. The crafting system in Days Gone is actually pretty cool, and you can actually make quite a few different things with it. From unique melee weapon attachments, to bombs, different arrow types for the crossbow, as well as health items and so on. You find parts scattered around the environment, and for once this actually makes sense in a video game, as you would be searching bins and rooms, scavenging for any sort of random item you can find and turn into a weapon during a zombie apocalypse like this. The craft in itself is easy to understand, and it's actually quick to make things, and thanks to the weapon wheel slowing down time, you can actually build items on the fly during a zombie horde battle, which I think is great as it doesn't slow your progress by making you go into a pause menu, selecting the items and building it. You just do it as you're running around. One of the worst side missions in Days Gone involves you destroying a load of infected crow's nests, and it happens later on in the game. Now, the main problem is that the trees with the nests in tend to have about two to three nests on the, any given tree. But the problem is, to destroy them you have to throw a cocktail or use a flaming crossbow bolt at them. But if you throw a single cocktail at a tree, it doesn't actually blow up all of the nests, it'll just do one. Why the fuck is it like this? If I throw one on the tree, it should just burn all of them. Having to now waste three cocktails 
on a single tree's nest is just fucking annoying. Especially when you then have to go and search for more parts to make more fucking cocktails. It's just a fucking ball ache of a mission, and I really didn't enjoy it. Especially when the fucking crows constantly start pecking at me. Just fuck off, man. What a shite mission. One of the cool things about the Freaker enemies is that they actually hibernate in the day in these little areas called nests, which can be found in caves or out in the open in buildings or in the back of a large lorry, etc. The game gets you to clear these infestation modes by burning the nests, so you can use like a flaming crossbow bolt or a cocktail to burn them and when you do a bunch of angry freakers will run out of the nest taking these down was always fun to do and i like how the time of day affected their difficulty if you burn them in the day they are probably all hibernating in there so a lot more will rush out compared to if you did it at night when most of the freakers are roaming around in the world i thought that was a nice touch The Nero checkpoints in Days Gone were another sort of side mission that I wasn't that keen on. I did them all, but they were a bit boring as they all followed a similar pattern and after a while they just became a ball late to open. But you do get some good bonuses for doing it. So the aim is to find a generator to power up the bunker doors to release the locks. Um, these generators always require fuel and sometimes you'll have to find a fuse to go in the wall as well so you'll aimlessly end up searching around the area for ages to try and find this tiny fuse. Worse still are the speakers dotted around these Nero checkpoints as you don't really know how many they are in the area and you need to actually climb up on the roofs and cut them all down with your knife otherwise when you do power up that generator and press the button the sirens will go off uh, and cause the freakers nearby to hear it and attract them to the area, meaning you'll then have to fight everyone just to get in that fucking door. You only end up seeing the ones you've missed on your radar once the alarm goes off too, so it kind of just rubs salt into the wounds. These were just too generic for my liking, and the fact that there were so many steps to do it was just frustrating. I mean, finding a fuel can in the area was annoying. Powering up to find the fuse wasn't there. And then having to look around for that was annoying. Putting the fuse in, chopping all the speakers up but not getting all of them and missing one, that was annoying. It was just a pain in the ass to get in there. Christ. Now, the horde battles were something that Days Gone heavily advertised as a unique selling point when the game was first shown at E3. And these battles involve you fighting several hundred freakers on screen at once. And unlike the World War Z game, which boasts loads of zombies, all of the freakers in this game are actually in the playable area at once, and they will all charge at you. They don't stay out of bounds at fences, so it looks like there's more there than what there actually is. These freakers pose a massive threat, especially early on in the game when you lack bombs, cocktails and decent weapons to actually fight these freakers off. So it's always scary when you are near a horde when out exploring in the open world early on. Especially if you have wandered off and they now stand between you and your bike. There is 20 plus hordes roaming all around the game world for you to take down so you will naturally come across some of them quite often throughout the playthrough and it's so intense even when you aren't fighting them and especially when you are. As instead, when you're trying to sneak past or run away from them, panic sets in. When you do go up against them, the key is to keep running around and use everything at your disposal, from the guns to the environment. These battles are just breathtaking because you've always got to be alert because you may think they're all behind you, but some of the group may have splintered off and are now coming around to the front of you. So you've constantly got to be looking around and checking that radar. The battles are just so epic, and they can last anywhere between 5 and, say, 10-15 minutes. It just depends on what weapons you're using. All in all, though, they're a great fun to play for. Another cool thing about Day is Gone is its open world moments. 
where they can be moments of randomness, scripted events, or just fun things you can do as a player. There's just so many cool things I had in between missions that I really enjoy driving around this world. From setting up ambushes myself to steal an enemy's bike after I wrecked mine and was too far away from any houses to find scrap, to being ambushed myself when going for fuel at a gas station, or when I was exploring a town only to find that I came up behind a group of enemies that were already planning to ambush me. Then there's the scripted ones where you might find um, a group of enemies have taken someone hostage and you've got the chance then to kill all the enemies and save this person. You'll also see points where the wildlife might be attacking the freakers. You might stumble across a, a deer crossing where some freakers are just attacking them. And sometimes you might see a bear or wolves or um, a, a lizard. Um, not a lizard, a leopard um, fighting some freakers. Uh, it's all just really cool to see. Um, and then there's also times where you see people trapped in cars as well. And you just hear them screaming while a load of freakers surround the car. And you can then save them and send them to some of the camps. And if you send them to the camps, you will earn XP as well as trust for the camp you've sent them to, so there's always an incentive to save people, which is cool. You're gonna be okay. Deacon and Sarah forever. These two and their interactions, their relationship, make the game. It's a couple you can really invest in, and while playing, I really wanted them to be together. I wanted them to get that happy ending. I wanted him against all odds to find her and make her be alive. Via flashbacks, you get to see all of the big occasions in their relationship, with some of these being playable, whether you're walking or driving on the bike. You see key events such as their first meeting, their first date, when Deacon proposed to her, uh, Deacon and Sarah's wedding and so on, I feel like it's one of the most realistic and convincing relationships I've seen in a game since Drake and Elena from Uncharted, and that is high praise indeed. High praise also needs to go to both actors who play both Deacon and Sarah as I really liked both of those characters. I thought they were really well rounded and they felt like a couple, it didn't just feel forced, it felt like they genuinely loved each other, they genuinely both cared about each other, you know, they may annoy each other at times, but they make each other laugh and they would do anything for each other and that was just totally unexpected from this game, I wasn't thinking it would be uh, a, loving, a love story like this and I was really pleasantly surprised with how they did it, and I think it's one of the best things about the game. Hey, what does it say there? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you knew Latin. Come on. It's Morier Invictus. It means death before defeat. Wow, I like that. Days Gone's end game is also really good. As when you finish the main story, I found myself being really impressed with what happens afterwards, as there are also a few small missions to tie up some loose ends of the story involving certain characters, and there is also a cliffhanger section. I won't spoil too much, but the hordes are also revealed on the map too, allowing you to find where each one is, and it challenges you to eliminate them all. So there is still plenty to do after the credits roll, which I think is really good. Add to that the three updates that have happened since Days Gone launched. There is now a challenge mode with various waves of different enemies to fight, as well as a new game plus and survival mode difficulty to do. So there is a lot here to play through. Endgame Sarah? Seriously, where the fuck is she? I was expecting to find her somewhere in Iron Mike's, maybe in your shack along with Boozer and the dog, or in her old workplace trying to restore the stuff in there. Just somewhere, but she isn't, she's nowhere to be found at all. I mean, come on, Sony Bend. 
The whole point of the game is to try and find out where she's gone, what happened, and get her back. You could have at least put her there at the end, at least. I want to go up to her and just see how she's doing, hear a couple of sound bites, just something. But no, you dropped the ball there, I'm afraid. He's in my house. Sarah? <sighs> so, in short, Days Gone is another awesome PS4 exclusive title that, at its core, is more of a love story within a zombie apocalypse than an out-and-out -out action game. It's a title that I found myself becoming totally engrossed with, and I genuinely cared about Deacon, Boozer, Ricky, Sarah, and all the other characters in the game. I found myself on the edge of my seat on multiple occasions whenever some of the characters were in trouble, as I just really didn't want them to die. The relationship between Deacon and Sarah is extremely well done, and well acted by Sam Witwer and Courtney Draper. And I really hope that they could somehow get their happy ending and be reunited, even when all the odds are stacked against them. It was a joy to watch, and it was a joy to be a part of it. The gameplay, while nothing original, sort of takes a page from the Uncharted book by taking a lot of different elements that worked really well in other games, and then sort of mashing it all together in a single game to create something awesomely fun. Sure, the game isn't without its problems, as I've mentioned, and it doesn't quite reach the same quality standards as something like God of War, Last of Us, or Horizon Zero Dawn, in terms of like budget quality. It isn't quite AAA standards because of all the problems. There's a lot of glitches and it's quite rough around the edges compared to those games. But that being said, it is still a solidly well made game, which for me will sit proud alongside the other PS4 exclusives. Even if it does come up slightly shorter than them, it's still miles better than any other thing on the market. And for me, this is probably going to be my game of the year for 2019 because I have had so much fun with it despite the slowdown, despite the couple of glitches. Um, I've still really enjoyed this and I cannot recommend it enough. So if you haven't already played Days Gone, go and check it out, man. I don't know why I did that there, but yeah. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.